So, they left you down here too? Such is our luck. But do you want to hear the kicker? No one really left us here at all. Think about it. It's up to us now. No one will find you. You have to find yourself. So go on. The only way is forward. There's no turning back. Because there is no back. It's already gone. As am I. Kingdom Hearts. Oh, what a game. A game I first heard of as a kid, and my cousin picked it up. I thought it was lame. The whole Disney thing just didn't really jive with me at first. I don't even know why. It's not like I ever really had anything against Disney. I was just a dumb kid. Little did I know that a few years later, I'd be picking up my very own copy. Actually, I started with the books first, which then led me to go out and get the games. It was about 2007 or 2008, just in time for coding. Nah, a bit late to the party, I know, but that just meant I didn't have to wait to see how the story evolved. Well, to an extent. I started with Kingdom Hearts 1, obviously, and when I first popped this disc into my PS2, I had no idea how much this little game was going to impact my life. I was in middle school at the time, a point in life where we're still trying to figure things out. Yeah, like I've got any of that figured out now. As if! But with the themes of darkness, friendship, distance, and the whole young love thing Kyrie and Sora have going on, this game entered my life at the perfect time, and what an impact it made. But this video isn't about the 2002 Kingdom Hearts, or even the 2005 Kingdom Hearts 2. Nah, it's about the 2009 Kingdom Hearts 3. Er, no. The 2019 Kingdom Hearts 3. Yeah, we waited a long time for this one, but to be fair, there were games released in between that some people seem to forget about, as well as re-releases with extra content. And those games were great, but we all wanted to see the next evolution of the series. I mean, we skipped a whole console. Enter Kingdom Hearts 3 at long last. Revealed in 2013, with trailers and info since, on January 25th, 2019, we finally have it. Or, Japan got it. We had to wait four days. But before we begin, I just want to give a few disclaimers. First off, spoilers. Obviously. I'm not going to hold back on any part of this game to avoid spoilers. I'm talking about the whole package. So if you haven't finished it yet, well go beat the game. If you haven't played it yet, go buy it. And if you have no interest in it, I urge you to reconsider. Trust me, I don't want to push you away. I need the views. But I wouldn't want you to spoil this experience, this game, and the series as a whole. Okay, still with me? Cool. Next I just want to say that this is my opinion, not an objective statement. I know that should go without saying, but I'm just making it clear. I'm only speaking from my perspective, so just know that I may get a few things incorrect. I'm no Keyblade Master yet, but I'm working on it. Also, these are my opinions alone. I intentionally stayed away from other reviews, analyses, and general discussion just to be sure that I'm only speaking my point of view. Trust me. I'm dying to see what other people have to say. And finally, these are my thoughts upon the first playthrough, so my viewpoints are subject to change, especially with the repeat playthroughs. 
Anyway. The game opens with a chess-like match between young Xehanort and young Ericus, spliced in with an orchestral recap of the series so far, a nice reminder if you haven't played any of the games in a while. And look at that title screen. Classic. So I'm not going to do a play-by-play -play from the beginning to the end. I've already got a plan of what I want to say. So before we dive head first, we'll go over the opening. So, chess game, Keyblade War, the gazing eye. If you watch back cover, it's some um, exposition. Stained glass, or dive to the heart. Besides the intro, it's our first look into this game. And gosh, is it beautiful. That classic Kingdom Hearts glass floor has never looked better. Honestly, I probably spent a good 10 minutes just walking around in circles admiring it. Definitely harkens way back to the first two titles on PS2, but a massive leap forward. Just look at the detail. Once again, we stand before Yen Sid. We are told to recover our powers, specifically the power of waking, and with that, we're off to our first world. So that's the opening to the game. A few cutscenes, a recap, but nothing really substantial. Just get up and go. So let's get up and go to our first world, which is... Olympus Coliseum, here we come! Oh look, we're in Olympus once again! That was not my reaction to KH3 Olympus. Look, the series loves Olympus, and I got tired of it after the first game. I mean, it's just an arena. Sure, Cerberus was a cool fight, but the gimmick of an onslaught of enemies packed into rounds just wasn't appealing to me. Now, don't get me wrong, I went through all of it, for the completionist's sake, but it's not really what I was looking for. The Cloud and Sephiroth battle was the only saving grace. Okay, and Phil, come on, two words. Phil was damn entertaining. Kingdom Hearts 2's Olympus was a bit better, with it actually being a full-fledged world, but I wasn't really a fan of revisiting. Rechain of Memories was more of the same, just in card form. Code had turned it into an RPG, which was nice. And then Birth by Sleep. A young Herc, okay, I guess. But Zack? Hell yeah. I mean, Hades, yeah. Zack Fair. And that Aqua date? How about one date? <laughs> Oh, you mean, no, I have to leave right away. So I wasn't too excited for Olympus and Kingdom Hearts 3. But oh my, this is different. Whoa. Is this Olympus? Gosh, it's amazing! I guess if you're gonna redo an old world, it might as well be this one, for tradition's sake. And let me tell you, it is beautiful. But there's one problem right off the Hydra's back. My first major problem with Kingdom Hearts 3. The first bright, wavering red flag. Phil does not talk. Now, this may seem like a joke to some of you, but I'm dead serious. Two words. Something is not right. You see him, but he doesn't say anything. Phil's not one to bite his tongue. So why show him if he won't say anything? It just feels so soulless, so empty. He just nods his head and then rides off. Even Megara speaks, and I couldn't give one drachma less about what she has to say. And you're supposed to be? But anyway, mute Philoctetes aside. The world is expanded upon from earlier entries. Now there's not a whole lot of depth here. Basically you're just getting from point A to point B while saving citizens from Heartless among a battered Thebes. But that's just fine. The fact that it's a returning world, and more importantly that it's the first world of the game, you shouldn't expect much depth. I think it works great as a tutorial world. We're already familiar with the world's theme, plus the characters, so we can just focus on truly getting to control Sora for the first time in 7 years, and the first time since a main series game in 14 years. It feels great to run around the new Olympus, and experience the wall run for the first time, and otherwise just running around, jumping around, skydiving. 
and bashing Heartless in this game that we've all been waiting for and now finally have, and taking in true HD visuals for the first time. So on those merits, aside from the silent fill, Olympus gets a pass. Plus, the Titans are just damn cool. Titan Smash! So now you get to pick the next world. Cool. And would you look at that gummy ship. Or rather, the space around the gummy ship. This is some next level ship. See, I've never really been a fan of the gummy ship. It was annoying in Kingdom Hearts 1, better in Kingdom Hearts 2, but just overall was never really fun to me. Thank god warping became a thing. But this new gummy ship? It's stunning. It now feels like you're actually traversing to the next world, instead of just playing a minigame on a specified path like in previous entries. You have free control of your ship. I mean, your destinations are still limited, but you can take whatever path to get there. And there's optional battles and treasure spheres, even some pop-up bosses. For the first time, I'm enjoying the gummy ship. This is some No Man's Sky Galaga Star Fox type shit. Before we continue on, there's something I gotta address. Now it may seem like I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but remember, this review is meant to be watched after completing the game, so you already know what's to come. But funnily enough, that's exactly what my next point is. You already do know what's to come. I'm speaking of course about world reveals. Ah yes. World Reveals. One of the biggest mistakes on Square Enix's behalf was revealing all of the worlds beforehand. That was one of the greatest joys of the first two Kingdom Hearts games, and even the portable entries. The mystery of what's next. When you enter a world and see that it's based on one of your favorite Disney movies, it's a real treat to see that come to life. But we already knew what to expect with this one. Now, don't get me wrong. Each and every one of the trailers for this game is a beautiful piece of art. The trailers themselves are masterfully done, but just imagine what it'd be like if you had no idea Toy Story or Monsters Inc. were in this game. And then you see Sully pop out and you're like, Oh no, is that Sully? Mike Wazowski? Woody? Okay, huh? Like how I was when I seen Remy in Twilight Town. A genuine shock. Even in-game the worlds aren't a mystery. In previous entries, you would get a question mark on the way to the world in your gummy ship. But in Kingdom Hearts 3, before you even embark, it says the name. Logistically, how would Sora even know? He's never been there, and he's just following his heart. But yet it says clearly, the Kingdom of Corona. Now if you've watched Tangled, you would know that Corona is that world from that movie. Already the surprise is ruined. But that's just assuming you shied away from any of the trailers, entering the game from an unspoiled perspective, like I wish I would have done. But upon watching the trailers, I was thinking, if this is what they're willing to show us now, before release, surely there's got to be a lot more to come when the game finally does arrive. But there kind of wasn't. The worlds just felt a bit shallow. Surprise ruining aside, this didn't offer as much as I was hoping for. Think about Kingdom Hearts 1. Those worlds were so well done, so integral to the story, that we repeated them twice. Seriously, all but Tarzan's jungle reappeared in Re-Chain of Memories. Or just Chain of Memories, if you're into that. And Sora recalling those worlds and characters, or trying not to forget them, it just kinda hits deep. Like, these places were important to him. And as a player, you feel that. Now I know Sora kind of jumps the gun on all of his friendships. Elsa would never rely on the darkness. Sora, you just met her. You don't know that. But you feel the connection there. In Kingdom Hearts 3, it just kind of feels like Sora and the gang dip their feet in, say a few kind words, kill some Heartless, and then be on their way. I don't know, it just felt more important than past games. Like the worlds actually tie into the overall story, but here, Sora's just following his heart. I don't know, it just seems kind of cheap to me. 
Like, couldn't you make a more integral reason why he's there? Like, I know he goes to Olympus because he needs to regain his strength. And Herc is known for his strength. Cool. That works. But what about the other places? I'm not saying there's absolutely no connection. See, Elsa has a frozen heart. Bayamax stores the data of a heart. But to me anyway, these worlds feel less than significant to the overall plot. Nonetheless, it is still cool that they're in this game. Now don't get me wrong, I don't hate any of these worlds. Anyway, we'll visit each world one by one. We'll go in the order that I play them in, starting with Corona. So we find ourselves in the Kingdom of Corona. Now I've never seen Tangled prior to playing Kingdom Hearts 3, or since for that matter. It's one movie I've been interested in, but never really got around to watching. Still, I thought it was cool to see it make its way into the game. So we arrive on Corona and find a tower. Now, dude's climbing up it, and then he's convinced to take Rapunzel to the festival. It all looks nice, and it's entertaining to watch. Alright, so now we're tasked with escorting them. So, okay, let's go. So, we got some forest, and more forest, okay. Um, a lake, cool. Uh, forest, heartless, forest, forest. Ooh, dandelions! Okay, this part is cool. The interaction between your abilities and the world around you, it's a nice touch. Okay, and some more forest. Okay, I'm sure you get it. There's a lot of forest. Not much else to say, but truly it all looks fantastic, and the bits of dialogue between the segments keeps it refreshing, and just exploring it is a good time. Plus, we're getting more familiar with our combat abilities. And all these ingredients, what could they be for? So with that all said, I still give Corona a pass. I mean, it's just the second world, we're just getting started. And it's clear that this world is just Square Enix showing off their CGI capabilities. I'll say it again, it simply is just fantastic. Majestic even. But there's just one issue. It's the same format as the last world, getting from point A to point B, like one long path. Though with lots to see and explore on the way. Now I'm not begging for needless backtracking, but in this style, you only seem to be a passerby. I don't know, maybe that's what they're going for. Just on a side note, Final Fantasy XIII is often criticized for its linear design, but it's been said that this was intentional, so you feel constricted until you finally reach Grand Pulse. Freedom. So with that being said, maybe that was the intention with Corona, and it makes sense considering Rapunzel's situation, but regardless, it's an example I feel fits most worlds in this game just passing through. I don't know, maybe that's what they were going for, but nothing really compels me to come back to this long stretch of forest. Even with new maneuverabilities like high jump or gliding, there's just not a lot setting apart the different areas, other than the name of said area and maybe slight visual differences. And I do mean slight, and this passerby approach is the main problem I have with most of these worlds. Except for one, which I'll get to later. I can look at most any previous Kingdom Hearts game, and each area holds some significance, even if it just comes down to how you overcome it. I can look at any section and be like, oh yeah, that spot, and know exactly where it's at in relation to its world. And I don't think it's just from repeat playthroughs of the older titles. I don't know, before the sections just seem more significant. Like the world was crafted around it, and it's not just a path through. I think the main reason for this is a progress in technology. Think about it. This is the first time we see Kingdom Hearts in true HD, aside from 0.2 Fragmentary Passage. The last time we seen a mainline game was on this, and because of the limitations of the hardware, as well as the portable devices since, each section of a world had to be treated as a room. It's a certain box the developers had to work within, and to get to a new area it involved an entrance and exit line, accompanied by a load screen, so each section truly was a crafted area, with walls and metaphorical doorways to the next. But these new consoles? They really mitigate those transitions. 
I first truly noticed that with Mere Automata. How you seamlessly travel from area to area. No loading screens, no doorways. And I think it's wonderfully done within the context of that game. But with Kingdom Hearts 3, without those previously mentioned limitations, every area just acts as a path to the next. Now, I can't stress this enough. Every part of every world in this game looks magnificent. And I know the devs put in some hard work, but at the end of the day, they're just pathways with little significance. And I feel that holds the game back some. But anyway, with that all being said, let's take a deep breath and talk about the B from point A to point B. That being, the city of Corona. <sighs> After finally emerging from the forest, you come upon civilization, and what a joy it is. This is Rapunzel's first time in the city, and some of her excitement seemed to have rubbed off on me. Look at all the buildings! The people! The festivities! I'm so excited, I could dance! And dance we shall! So now we see the long-awaited lanterns in this beautiful cinematic. Then Cliff has to... go. So he does. But then Rapunzel's mom finds her and threatens Cliff. But that doesn't really matter because the day is quickly saved when Rapunzel cuts her hair. And now she's significantly less appealing, but that's beside the point. Because the two are now leading a normal life of love. Oh yeah, they're in love now. But it's a Disney movie. I can't really take points off. It just comes with the territory. But now we're really getting started, right? I'll mark the first two worlds down as introductions to the game. And now we can get right down to it in The Toy Box. The Toy Box. Probably most people's most anticipated world. It's nice to finally get a Pixar world in a Kingdom Hearts game. I know myself, as well as just about every other Kingdom Hearts fan, wanted this for a long time. And some said it would never happen. But here it is. And look at me, I'm a freaking action figure. <clears throat> I mean, Soros freaking action figure. Dog and duck too. But before we enter, we get greeted with this. Yes, look at this. This Final Fantasy-esque action sequence, this is truly magnificent. Just look at it. But I admit, I was a bit confused at first. I am playing Kingdom Hearts 3, right? Like, what happened? Did my PS4 get sucked into a time warp and wormhole and bring me Final Fantasy 16? Did my game glitch and take me straight to the secret ending? No? It's just a movie? A video game? Within the game? Okay. Cool. Seriously, this cutscene was rad, and Rex is just as excited as I am. So now we're in Toyland, and we kill some Heartless and meet the gang. Buzz, Woody, Rex. Super cool. We accept a mission and set off. Wait, nah. We're exploring Andy's room first. Okay, this is dope. This is what I want from a Kingdom Hearts world. Look at all the detail. And it's not just rocks or trees. It's a living, breathing world. I mean, technically it's less living because it's man-made, whereas the other two were, you know, nature. But you know what I mean. Look, I'm out the window. On the roof! On the street! Okay, on to the toy store. Okay, fighting mechs, cool. 
but not my style. After a while, I just fought them Keyblade style or just skipped them altogether. I can't be bothered for another mech battle. Okay, not my cup of tea, but nonetheless a cool addition, at least at first, much like the attraction flow rides. Yeah, I got pretty tired of those. I wish I could skip them in my command deck, but that's a bit off topic. We're in the toy store, and boy is there a lot to see. Look at these toy boxes, look at these games, and look, it's Harvest Moon, or Story of Seasons. Curse you, Natsumi. And look at the dolls and the- Singing frogs? Is that Sora's theme? Okay, this is rad. Nah, Woody, you gotta keep running. I could watch this for hours. Why didn't you tell me a little sooner? So you fight a bunny doll lady. Not sure if that's a reference to something, but cool fight. So basically we're done here. Oh, wait. Giant cactuar. But yeah, we finish up and all together, I gotta say, what a spectacular world. But I can't be completely happy, right? Nah, it's just not in my nature. So the only gripes I have with this world is, it could have been more. Spoiler alert, not for the game, but for this review. That statement, that everything it has is great, but could have been more, basically sums up my opinion for this game overall. Everything it has truly is amazing, but I kind of feel like we got shortchanged. Like there's at least somewhat obvious things that could have been there, but wasn't. More on that later. Back to Toy World. Within the store is great. No complaints there. But look at that parking lot. I want to explore it. Let's go. Okay. Remember in Corona when I was talking about boundaries and seamless transitions? Yeah. I guess that's not always the case. Because I just saw a dope looking parking lot in front of me. And when I walked up to it, I was teleported to the street. I know. It's just a parking lot. How exciting. But seriously. Just imagine action figure Sora walking up to one of those cars. The massive size it would be. Or bouncing on the tires, climbing up a car, different models of cars, a chest on the bed of a truck, or just how large the yellow parking lines would be in relation to your size. And how you could walk to the edge of the parking lot connecting to the street that leads to Andy's house. Look. I know Andy probably doesn't live on the same street as the toy store, but I think it would be alright with everyone if they took that liberty. I mean, it is within walking distance. Or a toy. And it would make the world feel more connected. But let's go back to the parking lot for a second. Now think about the journey. The one Sora, Donald, and Goofy are on overall. Then think more specifically about the journey the gang are on right now, on the way to the toy store. To the player, yeah, we just teleport here. But in the perspective of the toys... They walked! So when you reach the toy store, think of how epic it would be to see it in the distance, a giant toy store looming over you at the end of the parking lot. The destination you and the toys were talking about, planning and plotting for. And you're almost there. The only thing standing between you and the toy store is this giant parking lot. And maybe some Heartless. And as you battle, you jump onto cars, dive under vans, heck, even dodge patrons' footsteps. Wait, I think the toy store is closed. Never mind. And then you get to the toy store, and that glass door slides open for you. You're in. You made it. But you're not done yet. And this is where you pick up where the game actually has you start. At the toy store. But this time, you have a sense of accomplishment because of the journey you took to get there. And that's going to be a big theme for the rest of this review. The journey. And speaking of that, let's go back to the street. The one in front of Andy's house. 
And let's expand it. Make it a path to that parking lot. And put hazards, even if it's in the form of a minigame, like the Tarzan vines. Maybe we all jump on a skateboard and Slinky pushes it because of his stretchy nature. And we gotta avoid cars driving and bikers biking and skateboarders and pedestrians' feet and sewer grates and litter. And maybe dogs chase us but get caught up in their leashes. The outside world is no place for a toy. So let's emphasize that. Much like the movies probably do. Yeah, I know. It's been a long time since I've seen any of the Toy Story films. Look, I'm a huge Kingdom Hearts fan, but a somewhat lousy Disney fan. I do like Disney, a lot even, but I often end up putting my time and attention elsewhere. But that's all beside the point. There's just one more area of this world I have to criticize, and that's Andy's room. Okay, no. His room is great, but you spend so little time there. I can appreciate that it's even in this game at all, because honestly at this rate, it wouldn't at all be surprising if the toy box world was just the inside of the toy store. Andy's room is an absolute joy to play around in, but it holds so little significance to the plot of the world. Like yeah, it's the toy's home, and yeah, it's the starting point to the world, but you're immediately told to go elsewhere. You don't even have to return. The whole rest of the world, as well as the conclusion, take place inside of the toy store. There's a lot to look at in Andy's room, but looking is about all you'll do. Now I know I already added two extensive areas to this world, the parking lot and the street, but let me add one more, the rest of the house. It's cool to jump out the window onto the roof and see the gutters, and to be able to run back up the outer garage walls, that's cool too. But what if that was just a shortcut? Like you and the toys find a way to open the window after you've explored the rest of the house. Think about exploring the kitchen. I don't know what it is, but looking at everyday objects from the shrunken perspective of a toy is just cool to me. I would have gladly taken these additions over the drawn out pathways of the previous worlds. I think I've said enough about this world. It's definitely my favorite one we've seen yet. And I know I'm kind of asking a lot here, but don't you worry. I'll be asking for even more in the next world. The only difference is, what's missing there has already been built elsewhere. Yes, I'm talking about Twilight Town. Okay, based on my toy box review, you already know where this one's going. Ah, Twilight Town. The beautiful city of Sunset. The birthplace of Roxas, except for the one that isn't. Which is the one we're in. See, the friendly trio don't know Roxas in the real Twilight Town, only in the simulation run by the computer in the mansion. But Sora convinces them that although they never truly met Roxas, he is their friend, and they're set on finding him. Touch him, really. And this adds on to the overarching narrative of the Kingdom Hearts series itself, something that was introduced in Kingdom Hearts 2, that being Roxas' friendship with the trio, that was later smashed apart when we, the audience, as well as Roxas, found out that the Twilight Town he was living in, and the one that we played through, was a fake. And that's my favorite part about Kingdom Hearts 3, how it's connecting all the dots. As it should, that is sort of the point, not only as a title in the series, but as the long-awaited ultimate main series console release to tie up all loose ends. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, we're still in Twilight Town, and this time, it seems a little small. So Twilight Town is what will become, in a sense, the hub world for this game. Wait, wasn't this already something of a hub world? I mean, not exactly, and not exactly here either. Radiant Garden was more of the hub world in Kingdom Hearts 2, with Twilight Town being more of a friendly world to revisit. But in Kingdom Hearts 3, it doesn't really hold as much significance as Radiant Garden or even Traverse Town. There's little reason to return here. Besides the bistro, but you can visit that from any safe point. Now, the game never explicitly states this is the hub world. It just kind of defaults to it. Like, you get a little bit of a story here, but it feels like it's mostly here to say, Hey, remember Twilight Town? And I'm like, of course I do. And then the game's like, Well, here it is. But just not all of it. Or even most of it. Actually, you only get the tram center. Oh, and you can have the mansion too but don't go inside.
But the reason this defaults as the hub world is because this is where the characters congregate. Foreigners, such as the Little Ducks, the Old Rich Christmas Duck, Moogles, Merlin, and Remy? Seriously, I was stoked to see Remy appear in this game. A genuine surprise. I was giddy. And he opens up a bistro, using ingredients from all the different worlds. Count me in! You're gonna make me cook? Let's do this. Knives down, chefs. It's time to present your dish. A tough decision. Both dishes look and taste immaculate. But there can only be one winner today. Chef Bobby takes the cake! Or omelet, or whatever. Yes! I did it! I won! Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Good on you, Kingdom Hearts. But why do they congregate here, in Twilight Town? I mean, Traverse Town is where lost souls from lost worlds go. Makes sense. And Radiant Garden is, well, Radiant Garden. But Twilight Town has its own identity, its own characters that all belong there. Not just visit. Well, I guess the mansion gets a lot of traffic, but not by Merlin. Why is he here? But my biggest issue with Twilight Town is just how small it is. Like, you're not fooling nobody. I know the town doesn't end here. You can't even go to the usual spot. How sad. And as I said before, the rest of the town's already built. We've been there in previous games. Why not let me see it in HD? I mean, the little wooded area is pretty cool. And the path to get there is different, which makes sense they would have sealed up the crack in the wall considering how much time has passed. Until Hayner reminds us that the in-game time doesn't correlate with real time. What? It hasn't been that long. But where's the rest of the town? See, Dream Drop Distance did something nice with Traverse Town. They took a world that we already knew and loved, especially the music, and they expanded upon it. You see the familiar areas, yeah, but now you get these new districts to explore. And not to mention, they threw in some characters from one of my all-time favorite games. Which sadly came up absent for Kingdom Hearts 3. I was really crossing my fingers for a Shibuya world. Anyway. That was a 3DS game expanding on a PS2 era world. Now we have a PS4 game downsizing a PS2 era world. It's just not right. Surely you could have put something in to fill in the rest of the world. 
or even put the hub world somewhere entirely different. The last few entries seem quite fond of Master Yen Sid's tower. We could have put it there, but we don't even get to explore his tower in this game. Only see it when the story finds it necessary to regroup, which in itself seems kind of cheap to me. I mean, we went there in Kingdom Hearts 2, but only get to see it in Kingdom Hearts 3? Now you may be thinking, isn't Master Yen Sid's tower part of Twilight Town? But according to Mickey's Facegram post, his tower pops up all over the place. So why couldn't it pop up somewhere new that we could explore, that could also house the foreign characters as a hub world? And it would make these story scenes in the tower make more sense as we're physically going there instead of just showing up for a cutscene. So for me, Twilight Town's a bust. It was cool to see, but we just didn't see enough. This world is just too small. For this next part, I'm just gonna group a bunch of worlds together. I don't have a whole lot to say that hasn't been said already, so we'll start with Arendelle. Ah yes, the Frozen World. Back in 2013, when Kingdom Hearts 3 was proved to be a real thing, and Frozen was fresh in the minds of every little girl in the world, we all knew that it was inevitable the two would collide. And finally, Square Enix revealed it in... Look out! Whoa. That's amazing! You can control ice! Control it? No, all I ever do is hurt people. Before it was confirmed, I don't know how I felt about it being my favorite game series. I mean, I kind of hated the movie based off its popularity. Everywhere you looked, there's Elsa. Everywhere you heard, there's Let It Go. So I wasn't feeling it, but once the hype wore off, I realized it's a respectable Disney movie like any other. I mean, I still haven't watched it, but I can see how it could be a charming movie. Well, except for Olaf. Silly spiky grass. But we all knew it was coming, and I was fine with that. Actually, I was even looking forward to seeing how it would be portrayed in the game. Well, here it is. A whole lot of... white. I mean, yeah, that's obvious. The world literally is frozen. But I can't help but feel underwhelmed by this world. A snowy mountain. Though the cutscenes look wonderful with the snow and ice, but the traversable world is a bit bland. The ice waterfalls are cool. Oh, and the ice dungeon you start in? That was a nice touch. But the rest is just a mountain that you climb three times. See, even Sora's bored of his mouth. Good thing snow's so soft. We could do this a hundred times. Anyway, you find Olaf, which I'd rather not. And you try and reach Elsa again. Oh, and Anna, or Dude, or Randolph, they don't fight alongside you. Instead, Snow Golem does. Well, after you beat him up once. So yeah, it's cool. Actually, I don't really have any suggestions on how to improve this world. Wait, yeah I do. How about you let me into that ice palace Elsa built with her powers of selfish sheltering? I mean, come on! I climbed up this mountain three times to reach it. I fought an ice golem and befriended it. I rebuilt Olaf for snowman's sake. And you can't let me into your palace? Instead, they're all just standing there. Outside. In the cold. Man, I'm out of here. Alright, next is Monsters, Inc. And I love Monsters, Inc. As long as they're not going to school. Jazz Clown! My Aunt Phyllis! <sighs> in the morning! So we see the outside of the facility. Cool. But can't explore it. Bummer. Instead we're rushed inside where we see the two friendliest monsters I know. But first... Oh! Whoa! Oh! Donald! Goofy! Could you guys take a few steps back? 
You're giving me the heebie-jeebies. You can't uh. just step back. Okay, so straight inside we go. Now you do explore the factory, which is fine. Expect it, actually. No problems there. And it's overall a nice world. You explore the factory, explore the factory, ride some doors. It's all cool. But I wish I could go through some doors. Like real doors. See the bedrooms, make some kids scream. Or laugh while we're at it. <laughs> okay, check that one off the list. Really, my only wish here is that we could have seen more outside the factory. We've plenty of doors to choose from, or maybe see more monsters. That'd be cool. Oh yeah, Randall. Yeah, lock him away, Sora. Wait, the keyhole? Why are you just now sealing it? What happened to Olympus, Corona, the toy box, Arendelle? I knew something felt unfinished. Why haven't we sealed the keyholes in those worlds? Wait, do we go back? Like in Cage 2? Nah, no, we don't go back. I mean, maybe for ingredients or synthesis items. Lucky emblems? But nothing story related. But there are those mushroom flan things. Like the ones from Final Fantasy that you can only use magic on. But this time, they're food. Like the food flan. Cute, too. They like their photos taken. But yeah, no keyhole. Alright, moving on. Caribbean. I really don't have much to say here, except, look at Donald, look at Goofy, and Sora. Oh my gosh, we all look amazing. This is the best we've ever looked. We made it, boys. Now it's all downhill from here. Seriously, this world looks incredible. I know I said that a lot, but dang, that beak though. So yeah, visuals aside, the Caribbean really is a well-handled world. I mean, we can swim. Like, underwater. I mean, water levels suck. But this is cool. So there's islands to explore, grab, crabs to collect, okay, oh, and Assassin's Creed Black Flag Ship Palace. Less tedious. And the story here, it kind of gets dark. I like it. So here's another returning world, but truly done right. Honestly, no complaints here. San Francisco. This movie always looked cool to me. Big Hero 6, that is. But again, never saw it. But I like what it offers. So we're superheroes, I guess in a San Francisco Tokyo collab video. And it's cool, lots of city to explore. The characters are likable. They really feel like they're on a mission. And Bayer Max is cool. Okay, twice as cool. My biggest complaint is that you all coop up in Hero's garage, and you have to talk to him to leave. Why? I'd like to leave on my own two feet, thank you. But you can climb buildings, skydive, grind rails like Cole McGrath or Sonic. And even fly a Bamax. Woo! I wish the city had more substance, but 
I really wouldn't expect a full GTA style city within Kingdom Hearts. And now, the 100 Acre Woods. Winnie the Pooh holds a very special place in my heart. This is the Pooh Bear I was given by my grandmother, probably before I could even talk, and he's been with me since. I've even been told that I resemble Pooh in a way, and from a Tao's point of view, it makes sense. Seriously, just read The Tao of Pooh by Benjamin Hoff. It'll all make sense. But I've always loved the fact that Winnie the Pooh was in one of my favorite game series ever. It's so cool to be able to interact with all the different characters in this storybook world. And the way you unlock different sections of the book through pages, it's a neat idea. So where is that in Kingdom Hearts 3? Merlin just casually brings the book to Twilight Town. And you can go into it if you'd like, but it's easy to miss. There really isn't any reason for you to go here anyway. It's just kind of there, which again, I'm grateful it's even here to begin with. But it just seems like it's thrown in with little care. So you don't collect the pages in this one, which is fine. Maybe they wanted to do it all a little bit different. But if that's the case, why isn't it different? It's a minigame world once again. But this time, it's not even fun minigames. A cheap bubble bobble knockoff. And there's three different minigames, but it turns out they're all the same. I got no enjoyment out of this minigame, which is funny. KH3 has tons of cool minigames called Classic Kingdom. Kingdom Hearts 3 has tons of cool minigames called Classic Kingdom, based on the old Game & Watch games. Most of these are really fun. They offer enough variety to keep you interested, as well as offering a challenge with each of these. They don't really end either. You can always go for that next high score. They're really well done and offer a nice break from the storyline, while still technically playing Kingdom Hearts. They're collectible too. So the more you look around in the main game, the more you're rewarded with these pre-retro minigames. I've had a lot of fun with these classic Kingdom games. Truly a great addition. Just be sure to turn the sound down. So if those minigames are so great, why then is the world that is traditionally based around minigames so shallow? I'm sure some of the classic Kingdom games could have been reworked to instead fit the 100 acre wood. But I've got a better idea. Why not scrap the minigame idea altogether? In Kingdom Hearts 2, Atlantica was a minigame world after being a full-fledged world in Kingdom Hearts 1. And we all have our jokes about the singing segments in Kingdom Hearts 2's Atlantica. But honestly, I'm happy to not have to explore Atlantica again. It's just the way it was controlled seemed tedious to me. Anyway, that world was a minigame world once, and a full world once. The Hundred Acre Wood was a minigame world twice! I think it's time we get to truly play through it. No dumb carrot throwing. When I was a kid, my brother had this Winnie the Pooh game on GameCube. I never got far in it, but I remember it being cool. Oh, and we had this really cool computer game. All I'm saying is it can be really fun to explore the Hundred Acre Wood. Why not give Sora full access to the world without missing pages or a storybook hub? Maybe we even go on a Heffalump hunt? Or run from Woozles or Jagulars? God! Is that a Heffalump? What's it doing here? And why is it speaking English? Get it out of here! <laughs> And the British elephant could help too since she herself is a heffalump. And litter the world with heffalump and woozle based heartless? Really give them a reason for being there. Which Kingdom Hearts 3 pretty much didn't. So Merlin passes a message onto Chip and Dale, and then forgets about it. Sora reminds him and he passes on the book. Sora notices he's not on the cover, and when he's greeted by Pooh, he says to Sora, your home. Which Sora finds odd. After the lame mini games, Pooh explains how he was hoping Sora wouldn't forget him. Kind of like how Pooh forgot Sora in Kingdom Hearts 2. Yes, hello there, somebody I don't know. And Sora reassures him once again that he'll always be there in Pooh's heart. But the strange thing is, Sora thinks to himself about how their connection has grown weaker. 
Except I can feel it. Our connection's weaker. Why is that? And to my knowledge, this isn't explained why or even explored. Maybe this could have been the central plot to this world, had it been carefully crafted into a full world. I mean, there's a whole GameCube game and a few others that did the storybook justice. Why can't Kingdom Hearts do that? This is a series that turned a 7 minute, 42 second animation into a world. But Winnie the Pooh, a story with many books, movies, and TV shows, is only represented with cheap minigames and a few lines of dialogue as a story. And it's a shame, really. Just another example of this game adding in something the fans may like, but not truly implementing it in a meaningful or impactful way. I just want a fun 100 acre world without all the tediousness. Oh well, close the book. This is all so new to you, huh? Well, don't worry, you'll catch on. I know there's a lot of pressure, but you'll not do it alone. Look, it's important you keep your chin up, though I'm not sure the darkness even could get to you. He wouldn't allow it anyway. You'll be strong soon. We just have to keep going.